In this video, you'll learn everything you need to know about working with audio inside Logic Pro X so that you can record, edit, and manipulate audio and get started right away recording your own music. Now, this is a pretty long tutorial, so don't feel like you need to watch it all now. I've also included some timestamps in the description so you can come back and reference different parts of it later. And before we dive in, I just wanna share with you our free Logic Pro X cheat sheet. It's completely free, and inside you have my favorite keyboard shortcut so you can save time while you're working. Also, some information and tips for the different stock plugins that come with Logic, as well as some recommended starter settings. So it's just a really useful PDF to have if you're a Logic Pro X user. So either head to the link on screen now, or the link in the bio to get access. Okay, let's do this. So first of all, we need to create a new project so that we can record some audio. So let's just go ahead and create an empty project and add an audio channel. Now this is the, the first way to add audio channels because you're prompted every time. And if you know you're gonna be adding or recording several tracks, you can just change the number of tracks here, set the input, if you have uh, quite a big interface and you want it to go input one, input two, input three, etc., you can hit ascending, but let's leave that unticked now. And that's one way you can quite easily add channels. Let's delete those. The second way is by just clicking this add button here and that brings up the same interface. And you can also double click to create the same channel again as the last one you created. So I can just keep double clicking here and there we go. So if we're just recording one channel, let's delete these and expand this one. Now you can see here that my voice is already triggering this meter, but you might not see that yet because you need to make sure you've got the right settings. And if you're using a audio interface, a USB one or a Firewire one, you need to change your settings. And even if you're just recording with a USB microphone, you also need to change that. So let's go to preferences and audio. And that'll bring up this dialog. And this is where we tell Logic, what output and input device we want to use. Buffer size, if you're recording, use a low buffer size and that means you won't get any latency. But if you're mixing, use a high buffer size because that gives the computer more time to process all your plugins. So for now, let's use a low latency and it will tell you here roughly what the resulting latency will be. And then you can add a delay if you want to as well here. But let's just leave that at zero and leave the other settings on their standards. So we hit apply changes once you've selected your interface. And now make sure this is on R for record arm and you will see your audio. So if you don't have it on record arm and this is defaulted to it, but if you don't have it on record arm, now this one's on record, you'll see that when I hit the record button, it's only recording to this channel because that's the only one that was on record arm. Whereas if I change this to input two, even though there's nothing there, you'll see that I can now record arm two tracks. So here I'm now recording to two tracks at once. And there we go. So it's that easy. When you want to record, you just press record arm and hit the record button. Now there's a few settings that you need to be aware of. So if we go to record, recording settings, we can change our settings here. So count in, you can also use this button. You can see when I press that, counting goes from one bar to none. But if you want to, you can change it here. And you can also add a pre-roll in seconds. And when I add a pre-roll, it will now wait two seconds or go two seconds back and then start recording. So you can either do it by bar or by time. But let's turn that off. This option here, Auto Colorize Takes, is really handy. If I turn that on and then go to here and press Option C, it will bring up this color window. And using this, I can change the color of this channel and you'll see the color at the bottom there changes. Now with Auto Colorize on, when I then record onto that channel, and it will stay red when you're recording because that indicates that you're recording, but now this has changed to purple. So that's a really handy feature. When you've got lots of channels and you're recording lots of things at once, you might wanna have all the drums one color, the bass a different color, all the vocals the same color, etc. And that helps you to navigate around your project. Some of the other settings are MIDI related and just be aware that they're here. You can change the recording path as well, but I recommend to just leave this on default and it will record to your folder wherever you save the project. When you record, it's important to record at a good level. 
So you'll see here when I'm speaking that the meter is kind of around minus 18. And this is the ideal level to record at. You want to be mostly around minus 18. Peaking, if I speak loudly now, peaking no higher than 6. So there you go. You can see it started approaching 6 but not peaking any higher. And a lot of people record really hot. They record at really high levels. And if I turn up the gain, this isn't going to sound nice, but as I turn up the gain, you can hear my voice distorting. And even when it's not distorting, at this point where it's close to distorting, it's going to sound bad. And if I turn it all the way up, yeah. So let's bring that back down to a good level. The idea of recording hot goes back to analog days when uh, you would push the desk to get a good sound out of it. You'd push the analog equipment. But they also had a different dB reference and they used dBVU. And when you pushed audio to 0 dBVU and above that to plus 3 dBVU, it sounded good. It, it drove most hardware and gave it a nice color. 0 dBVU is the same as minus 18 on this channel, which shows dBFS. Now, it can be, get a bit complicated, but all you need to know is that minus 18 is the sweet spot for the average volume of your audio, and that's where most plugins sound best. And minus 6 is... If you go above that, you're starting to approach kind of territory where you're going to start distorting and overloading your converters and your audio is just going to sound worse. So aim for around minus 18. Something else that you might want to do when you're recording is monitor the input. And if you have a USB audio interface or another audio interface that has direct monitoring on it, I recommend you use that because that's going to be instant with zero latency. But sometimes you might want to put effects on a vocal, for example, you might want some reverb, um, or you might be using an amp simulator on a guitar, in which case you need to monitor the output of this as you record. And what that means is simply hearing the thing that you're recording as you record it. So first of all, you need to put things on record arm to hear them and now I can hear myself in my headphones but an important thing to take note of is that you need to make sure you do this in the settings so if we go back to the audio settings general and these two options here so we want to turn that off and now any track that's record armed will be able to monitor and now I can't hear myself at all so I need to change that back and there we go, that's how you monitor yourself as you record. If you are using the direct monitor feature on your interface, just tick this box to turn off software monitoring altogether because you don't need to use it and you might get duplicates and you'll be able to hear a delay. So turn that off if you are using the direct monitor feature. A good little trick when you're recording vocals is to turn on direct monitoring. So what I'm going to do now is turn it on so now I can hear myself in my headphones. And that's just a switch on my interface. And I'm using the Focusrite Scarlett 202. Depending on your interface, it might be software-based. Sometimes you have to download a program and you turn it on in there. But a lot of things now, it's just a switch. So I can hear my voice in my headphones with zero latency, as in zero delay. Now, quite often you work with singers who like to hear reverb when they sing. So let's go and first of all, turn on software monitoring. And now I can hear two versions of my voice in my headphones. One is slightly out of time. But if I just put a reverb effect on here and turn it to 100% worse, I can now hear the direct version from my interface as well as the reverb from here. And because this is all reverb, it doesn't matter that there's a very slight delay. So this is a good trick you can do. Depending on the interface that you're using, you might be able to control some of the interface levels and gain with the channel here. So if you don't see anything above the setting box in your channel, just control click on it, go to channel strip components and then audio device controls. Now with my device, I can't control it. So when I try and change this parameter, it doesn't do anything. But a lot of devices, you can control the gain here. So check if you can do that. And if you can't, just turn it off. Otherwise, to set the gain, you just turn the knob or the fader or whatever it is on your interface. You just adjust that to adjust the gain of the microphone. If you're recording an instrument, you can actually use a tuner here as well. So all you do is go to this. And I can actually now, if I wanted to sing uh, in tune, let's try it. 
la there we go just getting in pitch there and let's turn that off quite often you won't be recording from the very beginning so let's just record some dialogue here just as an example turn space designer off and let's just go into the settings and turn off monitor because i don't want to hear myself okay so now we have got some audio to play with so I might want to re-record that, or I might want to record the next section on a different channel, like this one. So let's change the input. And now the playhead indicates where the recording will start. So if I want the recording to start here, I move the cursor there and hit record. I don't want to hear myself. And it will start recording. Once you've recorded, quite a handy feature if you want to listen back to that is if you use shift space, it will just go back to the beginning of whatever region you have selected. So as long as I've got this recording I just made selected and I press shift and space. I don't want to hear myself. And it will start. And I can just I don't want to hear myself. Listen to that as many times as I want from the beginning. Or if I had this selected, record some dialogue here, just as an example. Normally when you press play again, it continues from the cursor, but shift spacebar record some dialogue goes back to the beginning and that's a, a really handy little feature that you'll find yourself using quite a lot if you want to record several takes of the same thing for example you're recording vocals for a song and you want to record three four maybe five or more different takes of it so you can pick the best one later it's really easy to do in logic all you do is record over the top so let's record over this dialogue here and as I'm recording, it looks like I'm kind of overwriting it, but that's not the case at all. What you'll see here is automatically, if we zoom in, automatically Logic has created these lanes for us. And it's telling us that this is take one and this is take two. And what we can actually do is select different parts from different takes that we want. And this is really helpful if you're working with vocals and it's called comping. And it's also really helpful if you're working with dialogue. And again, you're doing lots of the same takes. But it works with anything, guitar solos, anything you can think of. And then you can just select the best bits of the different takes and it will merge them together. And it adds in even little crossfades here, like so, so that there aren't any pops or clicks. Then once you're done selecting your take, you just press this arrow and it's always there, ready for you to go and have another look. We can also do this in cycle mode. And this is really handy if you've got a particularly tricky part of a song where the vocalist needs to try it over and over again, or a particularly hard feel or guitar solo, anything like that. You could just highlight one section, like so. Say this was the hard bit. And then I can just record in loop. Of course, you can also use the U feature to loop to an entire region. But let's now say that it's just this section and we want to loop record here. All we do is press record and this is gonna just record over and over again. And each time it's gonna record it as a new take. I'd recommend that you make it wider than the bit you actually need because of course then it will give them a bit of a lead in. Once you've stopped recording, hit the down arrow again and we can see all of these different takes it's done for us. And once again, we can either select a whole take or we can just pick sections from each and do these manually. Quite often you'll only want to re-record specific parts of a recording. Um, rather than recording over the whole thing and then editing it later, you can punch in. And what this means is you play in back and you're listening back to the original take and then you only re-record a specific word or phrase or guitar lick. And this is good because it means you can put someone in a bit further ahead, they can listen to their own performance, get into the music, and then just redo the one bit that they made uh, a mistake on. And there's several ways you could do this. You can either do it manually, or there's also an auto punch feature in Logic. So first of all, let's do it manually. Here I've got a recording of just me speaking. Let's have a listen. The quick brown fox jumped over a lazy dog. Now let's say I only wanted to replace the word jumped. So the annoying way would be to just re-record it. The quick brown fox jumped over a lazy dog and then try and edit it so that this jumps was in time, which I don't think it will be. Let's have a listen. Fox jumped over a lazy dog. So with some editing that would work. 
but I couldn't hear myself when I was recording. All I was doing was just recording over it and doing the whole phrase again. So punching is good because I can just re-record only this one word. And you'll notice there, of course, I couldn't hear any of this performance. Whereas what if I could go the quick brown fox and then just say jumped there when I needed to. So the first way to do it is manually. We can use record toggle for this, which by default is turned off. And there's quite a lot of key assignments and, and features in Logic that are turned off by default. But if you go to Logic Pro X, key commands, and then edit, we can adjust these. So I've already searched toggle, but if you get to this main view, it will probably look something like this. And there's lots and lots and lots of options. So you can either just click this global commands and go to record toggle, or you can just search toggle in here. Now we need to assign a key to it. So R is already set to record. So let's try command R. If we press this and now do the key command we want, command R, and it will tell you if it's being used or not. It's already assigned to repeat regions events. So let's cancel that and let's just try something else like command J. Already assigned, command E, and just go through till you find something that's not being used. Try control J. There we go. So that'll take you a while. You can just skip to control J if you want. Um, but you can see there what a pain it can sometimes be. Okay, that's now done. So let's make sure we're on record arm. Make sure this is flashing. And then we can simply press play. And when we get to this word, I'm going to press control J. The quick brown fox jumped. And there we go. Now we can just change this so that it's only the jumped section. Let's have a listen. The quick brown fox jumped over a lazy dog. And you can hear my tone is slightly off there. It doesn't sound quite as natural as it should, but you can play around with that. And most of the time that works really well. Now the other way you can do it is to use auto punch. And I've got the option here, but if you can't see it, you can just control click on the top bar here, press customize control and display, and then make sure auto punches ticks. There's so many useful functions here that you can try out. And if you find there's settings that you, you use quite often, then you can turn them on to be in the control bar. So we can either use this button to toggle it on or off, or we can press Command Alt and just click on here, and that also turns it on and off. And if we zoom out a bit, turn it on, and then we can just adjust the boundaries. So we just adjust it so that it's only that one word. Now, when we go back to the beginning, and I'm gonna press R to record, it's only going to record this section here. The quick brown fox jumped over a lazy dog. Much, much easier. Uh, you have much more precision. You don't have to quickly do it. Of course, it takes a bit more prep time, but let's have a listen. The quick brown fox jumped over a lazy dog. And there you go. As soon as I turn this off, when I just record now, it will record normally. So you need to make sure that it's on and that your track is record armed. So there's several ways to record. Depending on the situation and how good a musician you're working with, you'll have to use different variations of recording takes and punching in and out. Because once you start recording lots of takes, uh, it can very quickly become a, a large project file and you might want to delete unused audio. And you also need to be careful that you're not accidentally deleting the wrong stuff. So say we've got a region here. If I trim this region like so, I haven't deleted all of this audio. It's all still there and I can just grab it back. But if I highlight the whole region and press delete, it prompts me, do you want to delete this from the disc or do you just wanna remove it from the session? So if I say keep, it's all still there. But where is it gone? Well, this is where we use the media browser. And you can see here we've got projects and this is all the audio that's within your current project. And we can see the waveforms here. It's also media and this is iTunes down here, uh, movies, and then you can finally browse just your normal files. And this is good if you want to start importing audio. But for now, let's just look at the project view. So this is all the audio that we've recorded in this project, and we can audition it just by clicking and holding. Brown Fox jumped over. A and it also tells us the bit depth, the sample rate, file size, and tempo information as well. So if we want to delete stuff permanently, we can just go here press delete and then that prompt will come up again and we can delete stuff from the disk. Now another really handy thing, if you're sure that you want to delete 
loads of stuff but you're not sure what's being used and what isn't you can go to edit select unused and this will select any files that aren't being used of course i'm not actually using any so it selected them all but say this audio and you can just drag it in what's being used in the project now when i go to select unused you see that that is unselected and i can then go to delete and delete all of them and if you click for all it will do it for the same there are some other handy features here like strip silence which will automatically detect all the audio and we can strip anything below a certain level which is the threshold so now i can strip silence and you can see what it's done here is deleted the bits between and that's quite handy for vocals or other things where you want to remove any background noise one two test one two but you need to be careful because it can be quite destructive and i recommend using a noise gate instead but that's handy if you've got really long silences between say for example it's a, a live recording of a whole gig you could just set the audio threshold really low so that it only cuts the absolute silence like this part here now that you know how to record your own audio you need to have a better understanding of editing and how you can maneuver and manipulate that audio within your project so first of all let's import some new audio so if we go back to that media browser and the media tab and then let's find something that we can import so anything will do just grab anything off of your computer uh, this is in stereo so it's going to create a stereo track for me and let's change that to stereo let's have a listen that's important thing to note if you're using audio files that are in stereo you need to make sure that your channel is set to stereo and it's this little button here that toggles between it so now you can see i'm recording two inputs and that's because it's in stereo if i had it in mono have a listen that's in mono flick it to stereo and that's the way it should be so anytime you're using a stereo file or recording stereo sounds like a synthesizer that's in stereo or you could even record a pair of drum overheads on one channel in stereo and you just click that little toggle there so now that we've got our audio let's look at how we can manipulate it so highlight it and press z to zoom to the whole thing and let's get rid of this whatever that is and move this and to move you just click and drag let's look at the mouse tool so up here you have these tools and there's quite an array of them so far you've only been using the pointer tool and we briefly use the marquee which you can use by holding command and then i can delete sections for example but so far we've just been using those so let's look at some of these other tools we have the pencil tool and this is handy for automation which we're going to talk about later because this allows us to draw in automation so it's a pencil anytime you want to draw something in you use the pencil so let's turn automation off and now let's go to the eraser tool and this is the same thing Again, in automation, we can use this to rub stuff out. So we can just remove all of our automation like so. The text tool is handy if we want to edit the name of the audio file itself. So I can change this to music. And there we go. Scissors tool is pretty self-explanatory. If we turn off automation, this just cuts at a certain point, which is good if we then want to move this around or cut certain bits out. We can also use the glue tool to stick regions back together. So this is two separate regions that I've got here, as you can see. But if I move them together like so, and then use the glue tool, whilst having this region highlighted, I then hold shift and click the other one, and it glues them together and moves that edit point. And what we can also do is glue over gaps, and that will just add a silence. So we click create, and that's now bounce it down with silence as well. We can use the solo tool to solo particular channels. Um, I've only got this one channel, so let's add some more. And say we had some audio here of me speaking. I can then use the solo tool just to solo this one channel. And while we're playing, I can just hold that of me speaking just to audition that or I can click this one
like so. And we can do the same with the mute tool. And this one is just a one click to mute. Zoom is the same as holding Alt. So with the pointer tool, we can hold Alt to use zoom. Or we can just use the zoom tool itself to zoom into sections. The fade tool is for adding fades at the end of track. So I just highlight the whole section I want to fade out and it adds a fade out. And then I can adjust the curve of this fade out like so. And I can do the same on the beginning of the track. You can see the fade there. And then we can edit it. And you can drag this as well to adjust the fade. So let's have a listen to that, just as an example. So you can hear how that fades in. And fades are important when you're editing because if you're cutting audio, you need to add really short fades. So for example, I could drag this. And this is another really clever tool is the clip tool. And using this, I can just drag the edge of an audio file. So what you would normally do is make sure that your fades were there. Just make sure there's not any clicks. Like so. And you do that at the end as well, but more on that later. We have the automation select tool, which allows us to select areas of automation. So if we added some in with our pencil, I can then use the automation select tool to just select these automation points and I can move them up or down or I can delete them. And then we can also add curves like so to our automation, which can be handy. Finally, the marquee tool works in the same way as holding command when you're on the pointer tool. And the flex tool, this allows us to add flex points and move the audio like this. And we're gonna cover that in a lot more detail later. So that's all of the tools. And you'll also see here that there's one on the right. And this is our secondary tool. So the default is to have the pointer as our main tool, which we can use to move, we can use it to grab the ends. We can also use it by holding Alt and then we can zoom in. And then when we hold Command, we go to our secondary tool. So the default is marquee so we can delete stuff. But if you find that a lot of the time you're using a different tool, you can change it to the fade here. So now when I hold Command, I now have a fade tool. And then when I hold command, I can move this fade and add cross fades if I wanted to. If I add a scissor point, you can then overlap the audio and then I can add a cross fade here, like so. And I tend to use this quite often, but you'll, you'll find out what tool you find the most valuable. It's not very helpful using the zoom tool because you can do that with alt anyway, but you have to be off of the region. So it is more helpful but you'll find what you use the most. Something that's quite handy that you can do with the solo tool is scrubbing, but this is turned off by default. So if we go to preferences, audio, and then editing, and go to scrubbing with audio in tracks area. So now if we highlight the solo tool, first of all, let's just cut a small section by putting this back to marquee. Let's just highlight a section and let's also delete here. Select this and press Z to zoom. And now if we use the solo tool, as I just showed you, you can just hold down to just audition this one region. But now that scrubbing's on, we can also hold and move. And this can be handy for finding particular hits. So if I wanted to make an edit, there would probably be a good point just before this hit. So that's a really handy feature. When you're using solo, you can also option click to make sure you play it from the beginning rather than click and hold which plays it from your cursor point. To get back to the pointer, we could go up here and select the pointer, or we could just press T, 
and this brings up the menu at your cursor location so you can easily swap back by clicking. Or you can press T and then another letter to quickly select different tools. So if I wanted to go to the glue tool, for example, I would press G. And then if I wanted to go to the solo tool again, I could then press T and S. And once you learn these different tools, you can become quite quick. And at any time you can just double press T to go back to the pointer. Now let's put all of this into practice in a real life example. So here we've got this Gonzo track. And what we're gonna try and do is just cut the intro straight into the outro. So first of all, let's find the right location. So it's that there that we're looking for. If we go to the solo tool. So it's this one here. Now the easiest way to do this is to simply add a scissor point. So we go T and then I for scissor tool and add our cut. We could, if this was a shorter edit, we could just use the marquee tool and we could have just selected the bit that we wanted to delete like so. But because we're skipping a whole song, let's do it this way. So let's go back to our arrow pointer tool, sorry. Press Z. Let's find the outro and zoom in there. Just trying to find the beginning of this phrase. So there it is. If we zoom in here. Again, T, I to select scissor and cut. And then TT to delete this. Then let's zoom out all the way. Drag this. Then we just need to get rid of that. Check we're at the right point here. Cool. Now let's have a look here. And if this doesn't work, we'll have to add a crossfade. But let's just try it like this for now. That sounds all right to me, but let's add a crossfade anyway. Let's just highlight these like so. And then we could use a cycle just to listen to that over and over a few times. Sounds pretty good to me. So we can press enter to go back to the beginning. Now let's go back to the pointer tool by pressing T twice. This is a really important tool here. If you are using the pointer, when you hover over the bottom half of the file, towards the end here, you see it's only on the bottom half at a certain point it disappears. We can then just drag the clip and this is essentially cropping it. So then let's go to T, A, add a short little fade in, have a listen from here. And that outro, that ring out is quite long there. So let's just trim that and then press T A for the fade tool and drag that in like so. Have a listen to that. And then finally we can press T G and glue these together. And then now we've got our merged file and we could press T text to change the name of this to Gonzo short. T T to go back to pointer click and drag, enter to go back to the beginning and then play. And there we go. Earlier you learned about recording multiple takes by simply recording over your audio and then we saw this view here. But now let's go over that in a bit more detail and learn some more advanced stuff about that. So first of all, you can press Z with any of this selected to zoom to the entire thing. And unfortunately the tracks can't go any smaller than that. So we've got all of our takes here and you can select a whole take just by going and clicking on it. Let's press S so to make sure you're in solo. If you're listening to a vocal, for example, you wanna make sure you just listen to the vocal and then you can go through and audition these takes like so. One, two, take one, take two, 
take two, take three, take three, and so on and so forth. Now you can also do this in cycle mode. So if I just press U to go to this the size of this region and loop it, let's have a listen. Take three, take three, take three, take four, take four, take four, take four, take five, take five, take five, take five, take five, take six, take six. And as you see, you can swap between them. There's just a very, very slight delay as you change over. But this is handy because you can just listen through the different takes. If you're working in the right BPM and, and the BPM of your project is set to the tempo of the song, it might be helpful to snap your edits here. And you can see here that it's snapping to the nearest beat or quarter. And this is an option here, snap quick swipe comping. Make sure that's got a tick on it. If, however, halfway through you decide that you don't want it to snap, you can just hold control and shift and then it will go to unsnap and then you can move it freely between the different takes. This arrow here flattens it and then using this we can actually switch between different takes. So say we just want to listen to the whole of take one or the whole of take two, etc. And then your comp is under comp A. If you want to add two different comps, you can go to duplicate comp and now we're on comp B. So I can have a slightly different one where say for example, I think this phrase is better, but I don't want to get rid of the first one because that was also good. So now I've got comp B as well as comp A. Let's have a listen to comp A. Take seven, take eight. So that's a mixture of take seven and take eight and then comp B is now take seven, take nine. A mixture of seven, eight and nine. This one here switches between quick swipe, which is what we're in now, where you can quickly move between them, and normal tools. And um, once we're in normal, we can then actually edit the takes themselves and delete sections or trim them back like this and use our normal editing tools. Whereas when you're in quick swipe, you can't do any of that. All you have is this quick swipe tool. So that's good if you want to edit the original take. You can also change the color of these takes. So if we press Alt C, it brings up the color menu, and then we can select a take and change its color like so. And if you don't want to actually comp to it, we can just click on it with the scissor tool and we can change the color of our takes, which can be quite handy because for example, you could make all good takes green and you could make okay takes orange and you can make bad takes red like so. And then you've got an easy rating system. Some additional options that can be quite handy. You can right click on these and you can change the color that way. You can also slice at comp selection borders and now this splits it into several comps and if we wanted to, we could delete these bits that aren't being used. Finally, you can also right click and do trim to active comp selections. You can also right click on here to alternate between the different takes and bring them up to your main comp. When you're done comping, you can click this arrow or you can go to this comp pop-up menu and do flatten and that'll flatten all of the audio for you. And then you could also do flatten and merge and this will put it into one audio file. Finally, you can also export active to new tracks. You can unpack to new tracks if you want all of your comps to be on their own tracks and a few other handy options are available there. The good thing about Logic is that it automatically adds phase in for us. So if I add a new comp here and then zoom in on this, you'll notice that it's automatically added a small little crossfade here, like so. And this is important because if you don't have a crossfade, you might be able to hear this edit point. But just because it does it automatically doesn't mean you can kind of forget about that. As I mentioned in the last lesson where we edited that song, you need to make sure you have a small crossfade. And if you're comping manually using the scissors, or say for example, you decide that you want to export these to their own tracks, and then you want to comp manually, you need to make sure that you add crossfades here as well. Like so. If at any point you want to remove a fade, you can hold option and then click on it to remove it completely. You can also add fades at any point by highlighting a region, go into the region options here, go into more, and then add in a fade out in milliseconds. And we can also add a fade in there as well. 
If you're using a crossfade between two points, like so, you can also adjust the fade type. X is a basic X, equal power is normally sounds more natural, and you can also try S curved. Another way you can edit audio is using the audio track editor. So first of all, let's import some audio. So I'm going to browse to file.wav here, and I can audition it using this button. And it tells me more information about it, such as the sample rate and bit depth. I can then click add, and it will ask me if I want to import the tempo information, if I say yes. And now let's look at the audio file editor. So to get there, you simply double click this and it brings up this new window. If we press Z, it will then zoom to the entire waveform. You can also get to this window by pressing E to toggle it or by toggling it on and off here is this little scissor icon. Now you can do everything in here that you can do in your normal window, but you can have slightly different tools. So you might find that having the fade tool is more useful as your secondary tool and maybe the scissors tool. But I'm gonna to stick to the pointer and the fade. And then everything I do in here, you'll see correlates to up here. So if I then trim this, see it's trimmed up here, I can then add a crossfade, fade out even, and it all corresponds to there. If you wanna make the waveform bigger, you can use this slider, the same as in the track overview page. Now you might think, well, how does this help me? There's several reasons why this is helpful. First of all, you can have different tools. But secondly, if you're in a busy project where you're really zoomed out and you've got loads of tracks, and this might be zoomed out all the way like this, rather than having to zoom in and edit it in this area, all you have to do is double click it and it comes up here nice and big. You can edit it with your favorite tools and then just close the window. You also have the audio file editor. And in this window, we're editing the file itself, not just the track, which is here. So let's duplicate this. Let's just pick a section. And now we wanna make a new audio file out of this one little bit. So let's go to edit, convert, audio region to new audio file and create a new audio file. And this means we're not editing the original audio. So now if we zoom on that, double click, or we could press E make sure we're in file, and then we can edit this. So if we go to functions, we could reverse it, we could add a fade in, we could add a fade out, and we could also invert the phase, change the gain so that it's louder or quieter, and a few other settings that can be really useful. Then we can revert to the backup, save a copy of the file, or just leave it as it is. And now we've got our reversed audio file, with a fade in, a fade out. And you'll see here that this is the actual audio file that's been edited. Have a listen. The reason you'd use this is if you wanted to edit an audio file without having to bounce it every time you can edit the file itself and then it's all done in real time. You don't have to keep bouncing it and re-exporting it. If you're worried about editing the original audio file, you can always use backups as well. So I can create a backup and then say, for example, I changed the timing. So I made it much faster or let's make it slower. 30 BPM process. but I can just do revert to backup. And now here I am again. So there we go. When you're moving audio around, by default, the anchor point is at the beginning. So if I move this and it's gonna snap to different points according to this line that you can see that appears. And that's because by default, the anchor point is at the very beginning. But sometimes it's a situation where you don't want the anchor point to be at the beginning. So say here, for example, I'm gonna play this track. I wanna make this bit where all the band comes in have a bit more impact. So let's have a listen. So 
So to do that, I could, I mean, this is quite synthy. So I could add kind of like a, a reversed symbol that kind of crescendos into that hit. So the first step would be to add a new audio track. I'm going to add it next to the kick because that's going to be the easiest thing to align it to. So let's zoom in a bit more here. So let's go to loops and I just search symbol. So I think that one's going to work best. So let's just drag that in. Now let's reverse it by simply clicking on it and going to reverse. And then now, as you can see, the anchor point is still at the beginning. This line that appears, if I wanted to line it up with a kick would be really helpful because I can just line up that line. But of course, that's the beginning. Because it's at the end, I could do it like that, but it's not as easy. So if you double click to open the audio track editor, but then go to the audio file editor, and you could open this by pressing E or using these scissors. And down here, you can see this little anchor in the corner. It says anchor and there's a little anchor image. Now I can simply drag this to the point that I want to anchor. Now, of course, we've got a problem here because I reversed it using this reverse option. So the anchor is still at the beginning. So let's untick that, go back to the audio file. So and this time, let's go functions reverse on the file itself. But before we do that, let's make a new one. Let's copy that, edit, convert audio regions to new audio file. Just call it that. Now let's double click this, go to the audio file editor. So we're editing the file itself. So this is destructive. Then we go to functions, reverse. And now we've got our reversed file. So now what I'm gonna do as well is actually trim this a bit short because I don't want the actual hit, I just want it to crescendo like this. Let's move it into the right place. Solo this as well. And let's add a short phase just so there's no clicks. Okay, so let's go back to the audio file editor. And now we're going to drag the anchor to this point to the end, which is where we want to sync it. So now when we drag it, you can see that this little, this helpful little line that appears, it's at the end. And I can hold control shift to turn off snap as I drag it just to that kick drum hit there. Now let's turn that off solo, zoom out a bit and play from the beginning. So that works quite well. I like how that sounds. It it adds more kind of drama, a bit more tension. It's a bit too loud, I'd make it quieter. But this hasn't been mixed yet, so I'm sure it will have a lot more impact once I finish mixing it. So that's how you move anchor points. And normally the only real case is when you're reversing, but there can be other situations where you might need to move the anchor point. Another tool that's really handy when you're moving audio around and making sure it's all in time and aligned is the flex tool. And we're gonna talk about the flex tool in a lot more depth later on, but I just wanted to introduce it now because it has some really easy to use features that are gonna be useful here. So on this first hit, let's say for example, I'm not too happy with the timing of the bass and I wanna put it more in time with the drums. If we have a look here uh, with the zoom tool, let's zoom in on the base and the overheads. So if we move that next to the overheads and zoom in on these, we could see it's very, very slightly early. So let's go to the flex tool, which is X if you want a shortcut, and simply click on the base and that will analyze it. Now it's analyzed, it knows where all of the hits are. So every time I get to the attack of a note, you can see it goes from just being single to three little things. Now this is important because when it's like this, you're moving it differently. But what we wanna do is just move the transient. So we're gonna hover over the transient until it does these three little arrows. And what this means is we're only moving the transient and pushing the note after it. Or if we were doing that, it'd be stretching it. But you can see how this works. It's intelligent because it doesn't just stretch it, it's adding silence 
or squashing it. So it's really handy just for aligning notes. Now let's just put that in line. I can use this arrow that's on the overhead track, sorry, this line, to just align it like so. And now when we have a listen, that will be more aligned. Let's solo that. So you can't tell at all that it's been moved. And if there are any other notes that are off, So there was one that was slightly late there. This one here is slightly late. So again, we just hover over the transient till we see the three little icons. Move that forward a bit. But we want to be careful we don't move it too far. So there we go, now that's in time as well. So this is a great little tool. We're going to explore the flex tool in more depth later. But if you need to move transients and notes more in time with each other, you just click on it. So it analyzes it. And then you hover over the attack of the note until you see the three little arrows pointing downwards. And then you can move the note like so. In this lesson, you'll learn about using groove tracks. And these are really important when we start layering lots of uh, loops or even your own recordings because a lot of the time a performance will be very slightly ahead or very slightly behind the beat. If the song's pushing forward, people tend to play slightly ahead of the beat because it adds to the kind of crescendo and builds to a climax and pushes the song forward. On the unwritten scale, a lot of people like to play slightly behind the beat because this gives it a relaxed kind of groovy feel where it's pulling the song back. So a lot of really slow funk music is very behind the beat. And this is stuff that we can't really accurately control using quantization alone because we can use swing but it just it's never quite the same because we want stuff to be slightly ahead or slightly behind the beat but thank god logic has got a great built-in feature that allows us to really match the groove of different parts to each other and it's called groove track so if we right click on any channel or control click and we're going to go to track header components and show groove track at the moment, nothing has changed. But if I hover over the channel number here, you can see this star appears. Now, the first one that we click to set the star on becomes the groove track. So this is the one that we want to mold everything to. So the main thing here is the beat and we've got a secondary shaker. Let's have a listen. Not bad, it sounds pretty good, but I feel like they could be more in tune with each other. They're just two Apple loops that are completely separate, so they don't mold that well. So let's set the main beat as the groove track. So we just hit that star, and now we can see at all times that this is our groove track. Now, any other parts that we want to conform to the same kind of groove as this main beat, we just hit this little tick box, and as soon as I hit it, you're gonna see the waveform change, like so. Now, what this means is that by ticking this box, we're saying, well, we want to conform this shaker to the groove track, which in this case is this main drum beat. So now have a listen to how that's changed. What I'm gonna do now is show you a quick comparison of before and after. So if I turn this off, this is before. Now with groove track. Off, on. So it's subtle, but it's just glues together so much more. They feel like they were recorded at the same time in the same room. They just glue really well together. So be sure to use groove tracks whenever you see fit, especially if you're dealing with music that really depends on the groove, like funk or R&B. A logic function that you'll find yourself using quite a lot is the snap function. So in this lesson, you're gonna learn all about that. It's really quite simple, but I just wanted to go over it to make sure you knew how it worked. So first of all, let's just grab an Apple loop from the library, anything we do. And let's import the information. Looks like it's done it already for us. When I move this track around, it's gonna to snap to the grid by default. And you can see here every time, if I zoom in a bit more, Every time it's snapping, depending on how zoomed in we are. So it's snapping to the beats there. 
but we're also moving a lot in between. And when I zoom out, it's going to snap on a larger scale. So now it's snapping to individual beats. And if I zoom out even more, it's now going to snap to bar three and then it's bar three, position three, bar four, halfway through bar four, and then bar five, halfway through bar five, etc. If I zoom out even more, we're now going to snap to the bar. So you can see position in this pop up window saying 811, 9111, 10111. So this is the default snap function and it's called smart snap. So it depends how far zoomed in you are to how much it snaps. If I zoom in really far, it's gonna allow me to pretty much move freely. But we can set it to snap to a certain thing if we want to. So we go to snap up here, click this drop down box and now we can set it to only snap to the bar. So now it will snap whole bars and actually because I moved it slightly off the bar, you'll notice it doesn't snap to the bar, it just snaps a whole bar ahead or a whole bar behind. So it keeps its position relative to the bar. So if we wanted to move it back on the bar, we could go back to the smart tool, move it onto the bar, and then bar, and now it's gonna to snap to the beginning of the bar. We can also snap to the beat, division, ticks, that's a much smaller rate, that's more to do with time than anything, but you can see the ticks going up there frames we can snap to we can snap to samples and that's going to be one of the smallest measurements because that's individual samples you can turn snap off and on at any time by just pressing command g and you can see as soon as i've pressed that it's turned this off you can also use this on off button but using the shortcuts better and then we can move this freely and that's good when you're dealing with audio that's been recorded stuff that you don't want to snap to the bar stuff that maybe you haven't been recording to a click but generally you can leave it on smart snap and that will be the best thing to do. When you're dragging, you can also hold control to turn off snap as you drag. And if you hold control and shift, it allows you to move really slowly by ticks. You can see 177, 176, 175. So this allows you to really fine tune. So just remember that even with snap on, you can hold down control to turn off snap or we can do control and shift to really slow it down. So that's the snap tool, really simple, but make sure you've got your head around that.